The issue is, I think, that um, the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists, um, who sponsor this series, and whose mission is to use IT skills to make a difference, would wish to improve the understanding of IT and its capabilities to the wider public, uh, which sounds like a very good idea. The issue, I think, is that probably when we think about the definition of information, uh, the worshipful company and, and other experts are used to using information in a rather different sense to the sense that you and I might use it um, in our everyday lives. And this highlighted definition here is the one that I want to focus on. This is a definition I took from Wikipedia, so like all definitions from Wikipedia, it is actually wrong in a small way. Um, let me just, this one here, it is wrong in some small um, manner. Uh, and throughout this lecture, I will try and uh, riff on uh, why, why it differs and um, how that difference, uh, what that difference means for us. But let's leave it for the time being and sort of crack on. The sort of hero figure, I think, of our lecture is shown here. This is Claude Shannon, um, and here he is actually seen striding rather purposefully, I think, across the campus of the University of East Anglia, uh, where he received an honorary degree in 1982. Um, he looks rather sort of magnificent and imposing, doesn't he, in this photograph. I have to say, this was in the days when honorary degrees were given to uh, quite distinguished people. You know, uh, there were no Big Brother contestants in those days, and um, on, the, on the list of uh, awardees that year were Eric Hobsbawm, the, um, the historian, Dame Alicia Markova, who's walking behind him, I think, and James Lovelock. So it's quite a distinguished company. That said, Shannon holds a light to, to any of those people, I think. He's a most important uh, gentleman and a fascinating, a fascinating guy. And I can sort of give you a, a taste for the man, I think, by looking at these artefacts, which I think came out of Shannon's garage when he, when he died. He was a great sort of inventor and a pl playful gentleman. And um, on the left is a juggling machine that he decided needed to be created. Um, and on the top right is a, a, a mouse, a, a maze-solving machine. He made a maze out of aluminium, and this is a little electric mouse that ran ran through the, um, through the maze and solved the maze. And rather early uh, machine down there, uh, as a rather early version of a Rubik's Cube solver. Okay? Now a standard um, third year project if you work in engineering uh, labs. Um, but the, my favorite one, actually this wasn't invented by him, it was invented by a computer scientist called Marvin Minsky, um, was something that's now called either a useless machine or the ultimate machine. And the uh, ultimate machine is a small box about this size, and it has a, uh, a switch on it. And uh, you reach over and flick the switch uh, to, turn it off, to turn it on, and a hand comes out of the box and flicks the switch to turn it off again. <laughs> so uh, that could be yours. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can uh, flick across and find the channel that will sell you uh, one of those, available at uh, good YouTube channels for between £15 and $30. So um, if you fancy one of those, crack on. So back to Shannon. Um, his most famous invention was something called information theory. And that's what I want to talk about uh, this evening. And this is actually the 70th anniversary of the great uh, Shannon paper, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, which you can see here on the, on the right. I guess I should say, as with all scientific inventions, there's usually a bit of sort of argy-bargy about who really invented it, you know. And if it's a good invention, the argy is bigger than the bargy, and there's quite a lot of sort of muscling uh, around about who really thought of this thing. And there are some claimants um, who you might sort of uh, want to uh, mention. You know, Ralph Hartley probably had some contribution to make. Norbert Wiener uh, probably did. And Warren Weaver, often I'm going to talk about the Shannon information is often called the Shannon Weaver information. Weaver was a great sort of publicist of ideas and um, republished uh, Shannon's work, so possibly he also has a claim. I think it's fair to say that what's interesting about this man Shannon is it's relatively uncontested that he is the father of the digital age. And um, that won't be true for some of the people we look at, but for Shannon it is relatively uncontested, and I think that goes 
to tell you something about the importance of this uh, little paper here on the on the right. It's a very good read, actually. It's available free, and you, you can all uh, crack on and have a quick read of it if you so fancy. So this is uh, figure one in that paper. And uh, if you sort of read across this figure, it's rather interesting. Uh, the paper dates from 1948. So just to remind ourselves, there weren't many computers around in 1948. Um, we weren't sending many digital messages in 1948, but Shannon foresaw, foreshadowed all that, saw all of that, and he said, well, as far as I can see, um, an information system looks like this set of boxes. So over here on the left, we've got an information source. It goes through this thing here, which is usually now called a channel, and over on this thing over here, we would now usually call that the receiver. Um, now, he didn't say what was in these boxes. And nowadays, we call them black boxes, wouldn't we? We'd, and people talk about a black box approach to things, which usually means, a black box approach usually means that um, you only have to consider the inputs and the outputs. You don't have to consider what happens inside the box. Um, and when you ask why it's called a black box, most people will look at their shoes and say, well, is it black or something like that? Or is it black in the sense of a black hole? You can't work out what's going on inside it. Just as a little aside, I would say there's probably a good case for thinking that they're really named after Black's boxes. Um, Harold Black was a telephone engineer, a telephony engineer uh, from oh God, 1930s. And um, at the time, it was a big deal being able to make a telephone call across the United States. And there wasn't any satellite transmissions, no internet, so it all went by cable. And in order to uh, repeat the signal across those various states, you had these boxes up telephone cables called repeaters, and they amplified the signal and transformed it onto the next one and so on and so on. And these were made in great numbers, of course, because it was a very long trip from one side of the United States to the other. And the problem was that some of them seemed to go unstable. They would whistle in a most peculiar and annoying way. And some of them were stable, and no one really knew why. So a guy called Harry Nyquist and Black uh, worked out how to make these stable. And the stable ones, of course, were named after Black. They were the ones that work. They were the Black's boxes. OK, so my theory is, sorry, this was a long digression, wasn't it? But th my theory was that a Black box approach is probably named after a Black, another famous person who probably we should know more about. But don't. OK, so here's the problem. Um, computers are digital. And that means they are based upon uh, zeros and ones. So these binary digits, or bits for short, are the, th are the stuff of computation and they're a stuff of messaging. But in practice, you and I don't want to communicate with ones and zeros. We want to communicate text, for example, or images or video or something like that. So if we had some text like this, this is a uh, little bit of text taken from Wikipedia uh, about a topic that will be well known to the, the Gresham experts in the audience. We have this sort of challenge as to how are we going to convert this into binary? Okay, well, that's a fairly well-known problem, as you can imagine. And um, what I'm doing here is I have converted the text into binary. And so, for example, I've taken the character A and I've represented it by the binary number 01000001. Uh, which is the same as decimal 65. And those of you who are sort of nerdy in the audience, like me, uh, will recognise immediately this as the American standard code for inf information interchange. Those of you who are not nerdy, don't worry about that. You don't need to know that. Um, the important thing is that we're using eight of these binary digits to represent each one of these letters. Um, by the way, ASCII, as it is now called, uh, ASCII is the, uh, the way you pronounce ASCII, it is not very popular now. Um, it's not an accident. It was the American standard code in the sense that it proves incapable to send um, characters from any other language other than American using ASCII, um, so it died out. But if I was interested in the size of the message, what I would do is I would say, well, there were 500 characters on the previous slide. I'm going to multiply by the eight bits. So this message, the message on the previous slide, that interesting text about Gresham's law, would take 4,000 bits. Fine. Easy peasy. Everyone can do that. But immediately you're thinking, well, hang on, there's a little bit of an issue here, or a little bit of a, a sort of interesting point, which is the 
letters in the English alphabet are not equally likely. Well, that is perfectly true. Um, and were I to measure the frequency of letters, it would look something like this. So uh, these are the letters down on the x-axis, and this is the probability that they occur in some English language corpus. Uh, again, I've, I've taken my um, uh, frequencies from Wikipedia, it being copyright free and easily available to everyone. So you can see that the most common letter is E. I'm sure you're aware of that. And then the next most common is T, and what would be next O usually, uh, and so on and so on. There are slight variations depending on the source of text in English, and there are quite considerable variations depending on the language that we're speaking. So you can use that. You can use that to spot the uh, language of text as written. Uh, that's quite a fun little thing to do. And just to preview an earlier lecture, a later lecture, we'll do that in the lecture on text processing. Uh, there you go. There's a, there's a promise. I haven't written that lecture yet, but I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll do language detection because it's quite a fun thing to do. OK, so uh, I should sort of add that that cons I said there was mild variation between text. Um, that's probably a little bit... Um, that is generally true. Um, there are some exceptions. I don't know if anyone here recognises this text, do you? It's, it seems a bit weird when you read it. It's sort of quite archaic, isn't it? If, I'll give you a clue. There's no E. Exactly right. It's a wonderful book written by Ernest Vincent Wright. 50,000 words. Uh, sort of unmatched achievement of literary whimsy, uh, really. Um, it's called a lipogram. And um, I, just to point out, as far as I can tell, the printed version of this diabolically does contain three errors. So it's got three, uh, four errors. It's got three thes in it and one officer. Anyway, anyway, leaving aside weirdos like uh, you know Ernest and Vincent Wright and, and Gatsby, uh, the English language distribution is is reasonably uh, consistent. And um, if we were uh, uh, around when people were designing linotype machines, which are typesetting machines, uh, this is the keyboard of one. Yeah, uh, the order of the letters is encoded on the keyboard. So etuin. Schurdlu. Everyone knows about Etuin Schurdlu. It was a very common uh, mistake in um, uh, newspapers because the typesetter just used to bang down the keys and you know, out would come Etuin Schurdlu. And it's sort of engraved into the, uh, into the folklore of, um, of uh, computer scientists. In fact, there's a computer system called Schurdlu, a very early system to do with natural language processing. Okay, so I've said that you know, these, these uh, characters are not equiprobable. So the obvious thing to do is, right, why don't we use shorter words for the most probable things? OK, let's do that. So if we do that, uh, we could do something like this. So, for example, here I've got letter E, and it's represented by three bits, three binary digits. Uh, where, and that, since E is common, that seems to make a lot of sense. And I've said... The length of that is three. Uh, B is uncommon, so I've allowed that to have six. Um, now, if I want to compute the overall length of this code, the average length of this code, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to multiply this length here by its probability, this length here by its probability, and so on and so on. And in this case, it would come out to be 4.2 bits. Um, now, I'll come back to this in a moment, but I point out immediately that just doing something moderately sensible, as we've done here, I have halved the size of the information roughly. I went down from 8 bits to 4.2 bits. That's quite a nice thing to have. If, you're, if each one of those bits you're sending across uh, costs you energy or is costing you storage space, that is quite a welcome uh, achievement. Actually, this type of code here is a very well-known code. It's called a Huffman code, invented by a guy called David Huffman. Um, Huffman coding appears all over the place, ladies and gentlemen. You know, um, if you're watching a video, um, somewhere in there will be a Huffman code. If you're listening to some audio, there will be a Huffman code in there, almost certainly. Now, Shannon was sitting there, and um, he, start, he thought about, well, he said one... The trouble is, you can see the problem here, every time I choose a new code, I have a new sort of definition. I have to think about the new amount of information this thing might produce. 
So he sort of took this mental leap and said, well, OK, um, is there a minimum amount of information associated with one of these sources of information? Remember, he did all of this before David Huffman did his work on code. So it was quite a good sort of leap. He was quite ahead, ahead of people. And what he said was, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about the probability of something and I'm going to try and convert the probability of occurrence into something that I'm going to call information. And um, those of you who are allergic to all mathematical symbols, don't worry too much. I mean, you, you don't have to worry. You really don't have to worry what this is. What I have to worry about is what it looks like. Um, so this is Shannon's definition of um, information. And if you're interested, the transcript I produce produces a nice little informal argument as to why it should be like that. The thing I want to point out to you is the shape of this curve. So when something is very, very probable, extremely likely, we say it has no information at all. And when something is extremely improbable, it's got loads of information. In fact, it has an infinite amount of information. R rather useful motto for life, ladies and gentlemen, I've always found. When somebody tells you something that's completely and utterly predictable, remember, that was a zero information uh, thing they told you. And when they tell you something surprising, make a note of it, because um, you're going to have to code it using a long word. Um, so if we applied that to my little um, toy example, um, he def Shannon defined this thing called entropy, which is the average of that information across the alphabet, that's this thing here, and for this little example it turns out to be 4.175 bits. Well, if you remember, when I was using Huffman, I got 4.2 bits, which is not as low as this. That's good, this is meant to be the lower limit for information, so that's, that's encouraging, that's what I would expect to happen. Um, but it is quite close. Um, in undergraduate lectures and A-level texts, it's quite common actually for people to say, oh, the Huffman code, which was the code we were looking at previously, is optimal, meaning it meets this Shannon limit. It isn't optimal. Um, it's nearly optimal. If, if you want to know, again, the transcript gives some more details, I think, but it's, um, it's optimal if the probabilities are exact powers of a half, um, which clearly they're unlikely to be if we're talking about English text. So it's a little bit sort of... Um, improbable that it's, it's optimal, but it's often close, and in many, many practical systems, um, it's, it, 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 it's good enough. Um, those of you who really know about this stuff might be saying, hang on, hang on. It is well known that English can be coded at 1.5 bits per character, not 4 bits. That's true. Um, and the reason for that is because here I'm working a very simple little toy example, talking about the occurrence of single characters. But of course, when you're really writing these codes, you think about the occurrence of double characters and triple characters and n characters and so on, They're called bigrams and trigrams and so on. We'll look at more of this on the, the lecture on text processing. Uh, but if you think about that, you imagine um, the, in English, the character combination Q followed by U is quite common, isn't it? It, it comes up a lot, whereas, um, as in question, um, whereas uh, Q and Z, I, I'm struggling actually to think of an English word that contains a Q and a Z in it. Shout out if you can think of one. So you can use that as a sort of um, an aid to getting a really, really efficient Q book. Oh, did someone have one? No, you just... Q followed by Z. That would be K -Z. Okay. <laughs> so, so I, I don't know... K yeah. <laughs> So very difficult to pronounce, so it doesn't appear very much in um, English uh, coding. So we can afford to use more to code for that. So uh, that's why we're not quite on um, uh, one and a half bits. Now, if you were sort of falling gently asleep at that little explanation and thinking, oh dear, this is all a bit hard, don't worry. I, I only want you to remember this. Okay? Um, the Shannon concept is this that the more improbable something is, the more surprising it is, the more information it contains, and the, the larger the number of bits required to represent it. Everyone happy with that? Great. OK. Um, it has some quite deep consequences, actually, but um, let's, let's just uh, move on a, a wee bit from that. Well, um, 
it might not be obvious, but if you think about it a bit, all of these things are, are essentially conditional. So um, we would often say the conditional information on something, and that means how much extra information is required to tell me why, given that I already know X. So, uh, and conditionality comes up a lot in um, information, if you like. And some, sometimes people call it the sort of shared information, the shared understanding between the transmitter and the receiver. Sometimes it's called the side data, you know, the stuff that we all know but we don't want to, we don't write down. And um, if, if you want a, a sort of visual illustration of this, um, let me give you an example. Let's see if this will work for you. Um, now, um, when you look at this diagram and I ask, what do you see? People often don't see very much. I, mean, I don't know what you see. You might see a sort of a Chad-like figure sort of peering over the wall on, the, on the, your left-hand side. Um, and there's something on the right-hand side. It's not very clear. Now, if I give you one word, I'm going to give you one word, and I'm going to hope that your interpretation of this figure changes. So this is an example of conditional information changing your understanding of the message. And the word is, is, is this, washerwoman. Few people raised their eyebrows. Okay, so this is meant to be a washerwoman bending over. Here are the soles of her feet, I think, and this is the bucket that she's filling with dirty water. Okay, so and now, now you've got that interpretation. It's difficult to get that interpretation out of your head. Incidentally, I'm sure I didn't think of this. I'm sure it's someone else, and I did try very ardently, being a no, the standards of scholarship in Gresham are very high. I tried very ardently to find the source of this. Uh, cartoon on the web. The trouble is you start searching for washerwomen on all fours and you get into some parts of the internet you really <laughs> would not like to go to at all. Um, so uh, sorry about that. Let me give you one that's a bit more innocuous. I'm sure everyone remembers this, don't they, from their childhood? Oh, no, you don't. Okay, so this is a Mexican on a bicycle. Okay, yes, everyone now sees what it is. Um, the point is, I'm giving you some conditional information and your, your interpretation of a message is changing. I should say at this point that Shannon, by the way, was very careful to not confuse information with meaning. And I am less careful, aren't I? I am mixing up meaning and information here. Um, the reason I'm doing that, I think, is because I know that information theory is used very frequently in artificial intelligence and classification. So I'm perhaps a little bit more comfortable with uh, blurring the lines between meaningful information and information. But Shannon and the early people were not. And uh, so if I had to defend myself, I would say, well, I am just using a visual analogy here. Um, so I'm sure you know what that is. Um, oh, it's a Mexican frying an egg, uh, of course. Um, it's not a Mexican on a tandem. It would be uh, something different. Uh, now, OK, fair enough. Uh, so far, we've been talking about lossless uh, compression. Lossless compression is incredibly important for the information age. You know, it's, it's one of the building blocks of <laughs> IT systems as you, as you know them. It's going on without you even noticing it's going on. All the time it happens. Um, and it has some interesting properties, which we probably don't have a lot of time to talk about today, but I wanted to just point out that there isn't such thing as a universal compressor. Uh, sometimes this is called a magic compressor. Um, so a magic compressor is something that can compress everything. And to see why that isn't possible, let, let's think about this um, thought experiment. So let's say we had the compressor, and I'm going to feed some data into my compressor, and I get this output out of this compressor. So I'm going to take this output and I'm going to feed it back into the input again. So if it's a bad compressor, well, obviously it will make it smaller again while I keep doing that until it doesn't get any smaller. Right. At that point, when it doesn't get any smaller, this compressor is no longer a compressor, is it? It's just same input and output. So it's not a compressor. Right. At that point, I have found the file for which this compressor does not work. Therefore, there is no such thing as a universal compressor, therefore you cannot find a compressor for every bit of information. Right. Useful uh, thing to know, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, it's quite common for somebody to send you, um, you know, they want to send you a video on, via email and they say, oh, it's terribly big, I'll oh, zip it up. And you think, no, don't zip it up, you'll make it bigger. You know, um, because 
uh, video compression already contains a form of zipping in it. I'm, go home and try it, see if it does make it bigger. I mean, it shouldn't make it any bigger. Uh, there are some technical reasons why it might work a bit to do with the, um, the header and the various other things, but usually it makes it worse. Um, different things require different compressors, and those things have compressors that understand them. So this is, uh, there are very, um, what's the word, you know, just as um, young people listen to the hit parade and they listen to the top of the pops or the top of the MP3s now, uh, we have the, uh, the squeeze parade, okay, which is, um, squeeze chart is one of those which lists all uh, known uh, lossless uh, compressors and how well they do. And what I've done here is I've taken the top of the uh, engineer's hit parade in compressors here, and I've measured them by compression ratio. So compression ratio is the uh, uh, ratio of the size of the output to the size of the input. So we can see that text, which is shown at the top of this slide, is the most easily uh, compressed thing in the uh, squeeze chart hit parade. And for those of you who are really interested, I've listed the names of the compressors and their settings that gave these results. Uh, don't please don't ask me what they are. They seem to change every day and it's a sort of, you know, little um, fan base for various compressors. The point I wanted to make here was se several fold. The first thing to say is not all types of data are equally compressible. Text is nicely compressible at the moment. Audio is not. Now, what, what should we draw from that other than that, you know, people haven't just put enough effort into this problem? Um, I think it's there's several things that I would draw from this. I mean, one interpretation of compression is it's a sort of measure of how much is known about something. Um, because if you have some knowledge of how a signal or how a sequence is put together, then you should be able to compress it. It's quite an important point. Knowledge of something should be encodable in a compressor. If you've got a good compressor for something, then you know something about the thing. It's a sort of rather important philosophical point in, in computing. And the fact that we don't have very good loss-less compressors for images and audio tells me that there's more to discover about images and audio, and that, that's probably true. Um, and I'm going to look at that in future lectures, actually. I think they're very interesting signals, and we're going to spend some time looking at uh, computer vision, which is the business of building computers that can see and understand scenes. And I'm also going to take one special bit of audio, because it's an interesting bit, which is speech. Um, so, in fact, the next lecture in this series will be on speech. So we'll, we'll spend some time um, pondering that. Now, you know, what, what to do then? Because um, there's going to be a bit of a, uh, a sort of compression crunch, really. And perhaps I can best explain that uh, to you um, by thinking about um, video. Okay, so let's think about a video stream. Uh, this lecture is being video streamed now uh, via various um, internet sites. Uh, I forgot to ask, actually, the technical guys uh, what, how we were streaming it, but I'll take a bet that we're probably capturing it using a camera that has uh, 1080 lines. So the resolution in this direction is 1080 and probably it has 1920 pixels running across. Um, it's only a wild guess, but it's a fairly good guess since that's a very common um, broadcast standard. And so if you multiply these two things together, there's about two million. So there's about two million pixels that we have to uh, send all the way across the globe. Uh, but it's captured in colour, and usually cameras capture three colours, uh, red, green and blue. Uh, it's an approximation to the way the human eye sees. Not a very good one, but it, it, it's good enough. And usually we'd use eight binary digits or bits to record that. So the cameras that are videoing this lecture at the moment are probably churning out about 50 megabits a second. Uh, sorry, 50 megabits per frame. We then are capturing these still images um, at 25 frames a second. So I reckon that's about 1.2 gigabits a second. Um, 
well, you know, is that large, is it small? And it certainly would use up my hard disk fairly quickly, as anyone who's worked in video will tell you. Um, what we have to think about, though, is what sort of squeeze we have to put on that in order to get it down the conventional channel. OK, so digital video broadcast, which is digital telly, um, ranges from about five, megabit, 5 megabits a second. Uh, that's about, that's um, good. You know, if, if your Virgin Media broadband is working properly and no one, else in the, no one else is playing video games and no one else is watching telly, you know, you can probably get that down to your, down to your home uh, on YouTube streaming, that's fine. Or if you're watching the BBC, who have, you know, large amounts of resource, it's probably 50 megabits a second. The thing I want to draw your attention to is there's a rather sort of staggering and alarming difference between the size of the channel and the amount of data that we're having to pass down it. It's really quite surprising. And um, frankly, if you think back to the previous slide where we were looking at the compression abilities of the best compressors I could find, they don't cut it. You know, lossless compression is not going to get where we need to be. So what do we do? We have to throw stuff away. Okay? That's called lossy compression. Um, and lossy compression is fascinating. And lossy compression may have it, it may be combined with lossless compression. Lossless compression is where you look for redundancies in the signal. And lossy compression is where you look for deficiencies in the receiver. So when you do lossy compression, you're thinking about um, how the human ear works or how the human eye works. And if you can model that well, then you can say, well, I don't need to send that because that guy, they can't see that or they can't hear that. Now, it's, it's, I don't know what you think about this. I mean, it, it, slightly problematic, I think, um, in the sense that, you know, the simple truth is that a lot of video and audio that we're looking at is to not to put too fine a um, point on it, made up. So um, here's Mr. Trump denouncing uh, CNN as, as, as fake news. Do you remember that moment? It was widely broadcast and he was very uh, excited. And lots of people, I don't know if you remember this, lots of people were cheering in the audience when he said it. Um, um, what he probably wasn't aware of was that he might have been actually correct in a, uh, in a strange way. I mean, it seems very odd to say that President Trump was right about something. I mean, he's so often wrong. You know, I suppose he had to be right about something. The, the, the fact is that the majority of pixels in an image like this are actually interpolated from other variants. They have to be because of the smallness of the channel. Now, it gives a very convincing impression of being real, doesn't it? Um, so if by fake we were to mean uh, interpolated pixels, that's pixels made up by considering the other pixels in the scene, then in a deep and interesting way, uh, President Trump was right. Um, just for illustration, the amount of information that's real um, looks something like this in a particular frame, okay? So that it, it's not that the, you send only those pixels and make up the rest. This is a sort of visual illustration of um, what's going on. Okay, as I say, it might be the only recorded instance of President Trump being right about something, and um, I better not tell him because he'll get a big head about the matter, won't he? So, um, but these streams that we're listening to are fundamentally designed for us to listen to. For audio, uh, the situation is probably a little bit um, better understood. Um, the default coding standard for audio is called MPEG audio, um, MP3, um, people often call it. And you'll see it, these things described as MP, um, MP3 files in your hard drive. Hard drive. Um, now, MPEG audio does do some loss less compression, so it uses Hoffman code, actually, to um, uh, model symbols that are uh, equiprobable but it also models the way that we perceive sound. Um, and it uses something called masking. So it, it thinks of the way that the human ear listens to tones 
And if it hears too many tones, it says, well, I don't think I'll bother to send those because you won't hear them. And you can imagine when this first came out, it was a cause of great concern to audiophiles. You know, if, I don't know if you remember this, but in the old days, um, there were lots of people who used to claim that gramophones sounded very much better than, de uh, than compact discs. And uh, there were lots of people who did all these sort of... Um, and when the lossless um, audio, when the lossy audio formats came out, you know, people were having the vapours in the corners of gramophone magazine and so on. Uh, in practice... It seems not many people have noticed. But I, I wouldn't like to fool you and say that uh, MPEG audio is a replica of what it hears. It most definitely is not. It is a code that is designed to be listened to by humans. Now, I'd like to give you a demonstration of this, but um, I don't want to demonstrate masking because um, it's not a very good demo, actually. And, um, but I would like to give you a, a demo of something that... Um, will demonstrate to you that your ears are perhaps not as reliable as all that. So the, the obvious one to pick, I thought, was something called the shepherd tone. Shepherd tone is great fun. I mean, the, um, almost everyone in this room will be able to associate pitch with, uh, with a tone. And it's a rather interesting fact, pitch. So um, it's what musicians call frequency of the fundamental. And we all know the experience that somebody plays a middle C on a piano and it seems to sound the same as uh, the same note played on uh, a cello or a harmonium. It has, uh, it's got the same pitch, as we say, but has a different quality. Um, so you're able to identify this pitch irrespective, really, of the shape of the waveform. The only thing you seem to pull out are the zero crossings or the frequency of the waveform. Well, this very interesting guy called Roger Shepard uh, had a go at this, and he created this wonderful illusion called the Shepard Tone. Um, now, let's see if we can give you a quick blast of the Shepard Tone. The Shepard Tone is peculiar because it seems to have either always rising or always falling pitch. Makes the, makes the hairs on my back of my neck uh, cringe. Uh, so, um, good point. Um, audio coding is not made for dogs. Right? It's made for humans. Um, I've often wondered about this. My, uh, I've noticed my dog, um, Algernon, doesn't hear, he's very good at barking at other dogs, and uh, he doesn't do it so often now. Now that we have an all-digital household, you know, we've got digital radios and digital television, he doesn't seem to bark so frequently at, at uh, other dogs on the telly. He certainly used to. Um, and that's either because he's getting old and deaf or it's because um, he knows that, or he is, he is unaware of the fact that audio is now coded for me and not for him. OK. All, all well and good. So we've quickly said uh, probability, that's surprise, uh, improbable events... That's related to information. We can use that. We can design these cool coders that are really important and they allow us to save lots of energy and lots of time and so on and so on. Well, that all seems very satisfactory and indeed it is the basis of most modern communication systems. All well and good. So if I was going to code a string of digits like this, um, then you knowing, as you do now, about um, Shannon information, you'd say, well, I'll work out how much information is required to code that sequence of 10 digits. And you'd say to me, well, 10 isn't enough. Um, I must know the probabilities of these digits. So I'll tell you, they're equiprobable. So you'd say, oh, yes, 1 over 10, log 2, 1 over 10, minus that, 3.3 bits per symbol. So 10 symbols, 33 bits. No worries with that. That's, that's an exact follow-on from... Uh, uh, my previous remarks, I think. No, so all, we're all cushy with that. And so 100 symbols will be 10 times as large, 330 bits. 1,000 symbols would be 3,300 bits. A million symbols would be, well, just to be technically right, it would be approximately a megabit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, 
a megabit in the digital world isn't a, thou uh, isn't a million, it's 1,024 times 1,024, but let's leave that to one side, okay? So it's roughly 3.3 uh, uh, megabits. All well and good. But I'm, I'm sure intelligent people in this audience are already bristling at this thought, and, and so am I, really. There's a problem here, and the problem is that those are the first 10 digits of pi. You know, and um, it is true that the digits of pi are roughly equally distributed, but I think the challenge of this really is, are you really saying, Richard, that it, it takes an infinite amount of information to transmit pi? Because if so, the internet's going to break, because I've just transmitted it to you. I just said pi, and you knew roughly what I meant. I mean, you might have forgotten your high school mathematics, but you were, you were vaguely aware of the concept called pi, I should think, and some of you certainly haven't forgotten your high school mathematics and can give me a very good definition of it. Um, so that is a sort of a bit of a, a bit of a downer, really, and it gives you some sort of concern that um, things aren't quite as nice as you would like. And you, you might try and sort of step away from the concern by saying, well, it's conditionality is operating here. We have this shared information, don't we? You and I, intelligent people, know what pi is, so I just need to send you the pointer to pi, as it were, and you say, oh, yes, pi, I know what that is, and so on. And, well, OK, so what about e, you know, the exponential constant? And what about i, the square root of minus 1? You know, not everybody knows everything, um, so that's not great. And anyway, electrical engineers don't call it I, they call it J. So, you know, it, there's something rather unsatisfactory about all of this. And what's happened is that Shannon's information is all based on the idea of probability. So the idea is that things will keep happening and we can measure them. But what I'm talking about here is a specific message, a message relating to a sequence of digits. Well, that's, uh, that was a problem uh, considered some time ago. And uh, the lad who gave this in consideration was Andrei uh, Kolmogorov. And uh, here is the great uh, Kolmogorov uh, hanging out at the uh, chalkboard. He was a um, uh, keen lecturer, apparently. Now, if you remember, I said that the sort of moniker of uh, Shannon as the father of the information age was relatively uncontested. That's true. Um, Kolmogorov information is a bit more contested. Um, some people favour Ray Solomonov as the inventor of it. Uh, other people speak highly of Greg Chaitin. I mean, I don't want to get into that, really. I, I think the, the computer scientist Ming Lee got this right. He, he described um, this as the equivalent to the Matthew effect, in the sense that those who have inventions will be ascribed more, and those who have none will be, deni will be denied them. So anyway, uh, Kolmogorov information. Uh, it's a very beautiful idea. And so the idea is that the information or content of an object is not the object, but it's the length of the shortest program that can compute the object. Neat. Okay. Very nice uh, idea. So pi, well, this was the shortest program I could find for computing pi. Um, 160 characters. So if it has 160 characters, uh, 8 bits a character, let's say, that's 1,280 bits. So I'm confident that the information in pi is less than 1,280 bits. Now, it doesn't tell me how to find this program. So if I could find a shorter program, then I could state confidently that pi contains less information than that. But at least I've got an upper limit, and it's a limit that's based upon the particular information that's available to us in that, uh, in, in, in this case. So we can have, co uh, we can have um, conditional Kolmogorov uh, information. So that's the, if I've got a program to compute um, Y, then the conditional uh, of uh, X given Y is the modifications I have to make to that program in order to compute X. So obviously, if X is completely different from Y, then there's not much I can do. But if X is some function of it, rather than just printing Y, I could just print the function of it and get there very quickly. So this Kolmogorov information is really rather neat and powerful. We 
call things incompressible if the program that we have for reproducing it is a really sort of silly program and all it can do is just repeat the information. So that's the definition of incompressibility. So if no program can be found, all the program can do is just repeat the digits, then it's incompressible. So a, uh, you know, a set of random, truly random digits would have uh, this rather naive uh, program. But almost every object that we can think of has this sort of algorithmic equivalent. So I can now equate information to the size of the machine that creates that information. Or to put it another way, there's an equivalence between the thing, its pattern, digital pattern, the code that we use to represent that pattern, the algorithm that creates it. They're all the same thing. And in terms of your thinking, you, can, you should be able to interchange between any one of these uh, views. And um, this is a very uh, attractive view that for certain types of science. And it's sort of leading, to, I think, to a new way of looking at things, which I find uh, rather interesting. So uh, this is perhaps a little bit of a caricature, but in, in old science, we used to sort of study the thing. And what we're now interested in doing, at least to some extent, is studying the creation of that thing. What is the machine, what is the algorithm to um, create that machine? Now, I should say quickly at this point, this is not an opportunity for the intelligent design freaks to suddenly come in and crowbar their way into this conversation. I'm talking about algorithms here. I, I have nothing to say on um, you know, uh, theological matters. Um, what is interesting about this, though, is to think about the algorithmic uh, consequences of this. And there's a lot of people working in this area. I, I, I'm going to slightly invidiously um, sort of call out um, somebody who I know. Um, and uh, there's a rather interesting group of people um, led by Professor Enrico Cohen, FRS, at the um, John Innes Centre for Microbiology, who worked with a collaborator of mine called the late, the late Professor Andrew Bangham. And um, they were interested in the way that plants grow. That's developmental biology. So how, does, how do things develop? It's a rather interesting question, isn't it? You know, I mean, um, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that most of us in this audience have, have two eyes and a nose. You know, well, what, why do we have that? You know, um, when people say that my, I have my father's ears, you know, um, what, what do they mean by that? I mean, obviously, I, I don't literally have my father's ears. I mean, if I did ha literally have my father's ears, they would be identical to my father. And I can tell you now that there's a very interesting guy called Mark Nixon at the University of Southampton who studies ears as a biometric for people. And he can tell you that your father's ears are different from your ears. So they're not different at a micro level. Um, and so I doubt my father passed on the algorithm for constructing ears. What he passed on was some sort of code that was interpreted by an algorithm in the human being that created ears. So I think this sort of Kolmogorov idea leads to this rather fascinating uh, prospect that you can think of not only the study of the artifacts, but the study of the objects that create the artifacts. Well, you can go further with Kolmogorov information. There's a very interesting um, and very controversial paper by um, which I better not spend too much time look, talking about. We'll talk about it in the tech lecture on text in which um, the uh, Kolmogorov complexity was approximated by a compression algorithm. And the advantage of doing that is that you can then you can compress um, one group of things, you can compress another group of things, and then you can compress them together. And when you compress them together, if they're similar, they should get smaller than you might expect just by putting them together. Because if they're similar, the compressor will spot they're similar and get some extra compression. So uh, that idea was developed by a very nice Dutch scientist called Paul Vit Vittigny. And uh, Paul developed this thing called information normalised compression distance, which is a way of using this Kolmogorov complexity to see how similar things are. Well, a long time ago, I had a very nice graduate student called Daniel Rice who got interested in this. And I said, well, go away and get some text, compute the normalised compression distance between these things and project it onto a piece of paper so we can look at these text objects, please. 
Well, this is what he did. He took some text from uh, Shakespeare and he took some text from Conan Doyle and he visualised them. And um, I think you can see rather gratifyingly, we have all of the, I hope we have all of the Conan Doyle on the left and we have all of the Shakespeare on the right. Um, is there any crossover? Um, you can put a straight line down the middle, which in um, machine learning terms or artificial intelligence terms, we would say that is linearly separable patterns. Okay, no biggie. This is a very easy thing to do if you use some conventional text processing algorithm. What's interesting about this is we were only using a compressor. A compressor was not designed to tell the difference between Conan Doyle and Shakespeare. Zip does not understand Shakespeare. The consequences of using Zip to measure compression distances means you can understand interesting things about the world and those interesting things are predicated on the algorithms that constructed those things. Okay, so that leads us to um, the title of this lecture, which was It from Bit. Uh, this wonderful scientist called John Wheeler famously posed what he called a number of RBQs. RBQs are really big questions, you know, things like why the quantum, uh, how come existence, and so on. And one of his RBQs was It from Bit. And it is a question, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm not asserting uh, here that um, the universe is a computer or any of those uh, things. Uh, I am merely alerting you to this question, and it's a sort of chicken and egg question. In fact, it's the ultimate chicken and egg question, which is, did the physical thing, the it, come first, or did the algorithmic description of the thing come first? And it's true that there's a new area of physics called digital physics that is sort of riffing on these, um, these two ways of thinking. Digital physics interchanges the algorithmic with the physical and leads to all sorts of rather fascinating and interesting uh, questions about life, the universe, and other things. So in terms of my interest in this, I have to admit I am going to skip rather neatly over the philosophy and the digital physics aspects of this. Uh, that's partly because, well, it's partly because I'm a coward, I think. And um, I think it also it is terribly controversial, this. I mean, if, you're, if you are interested, there's a lot of, lot of YouTube chatter about this um, where people are, respectable physicists seem to be seriously claiming that we are living in the matrix. Um, and the, the basis for this is that they discovered that the algebras that are used for string theory contain within them the same algebras that are used for error control codes. Ergo, we're living in the matrix. Woo, freak. Well, uh, I, I'm not very attracted to that theory. and No one is very attracted to think that they're living in a machine. Um, anyway, it's quite an old idea. Um, Konrad Zuse, who was the inventor of a programmable computer, a uh, very enterprising German engineer, wrote a uh, very nice book on precisely that idea some time ago. The whole universe is the output of some uh, frighteningly complex computation and we are just um, lines of code within it. You know? So I, would, I frankly would like to steer away from some of that aspect, but I would like to look at this aspect. I'd like to think about how this information theory can explain some of the things we see in everyday life. So I'd like to do some explaining. I'd like to talk about the way the technology can interact with those applications to create you know, all of this sort of digital world and wealth and wonder that we experience every day. And my plan is to do that in the next series of five lectures, and I hope you'll tune in. Thank you. <laughs>